When designing springs, we usually have a lot of freedom when it comes to deciding on its properties and parameters, from the material we select and the shot peening process we previously looked at, to the dimensions like coil and wire diameter and number of coils. This is of course not limited only to the actual design process of a spring, but also to the very common selection process when choosing an off-the-shelf spring for a specific application. During the last four main videos, we have learned all the core concepts of spring design. These include three main categories. The first is related to calculating the spring constant, which is one of the most important parameters of a spring you're interested in when looking to add a spring to your design. And it includes concepts like the number of active coils, the total number of coils, pitch, wire diameter, and terminal ends options for compression springs. The second one has to do with calculating stresses. Specifically, the shearing stress, only kind of stress present in a compression spring while being compressed, and to find it, you find the spring index and the curvature correction factor Kb. And the third one, estimating the material properties against which the stresses you calculate will be compared to, like the tensile strength SUT, the shearing yield strength SSY, the torsional modulus of rupture SSU, and the shearing endurance limit SSE. Notice that the spring constant calculation K doesn't change regardless of the loading, static or fatigue related. The stresses, even though you would use a static constant force F for static loading, and an average and an alternating force FM and FA for fatigue, are also calculated using the same shearing stress equation for springs, and even the curvature correction factor KB does not change. The tensile strength is needed for both cases too, static and fatigue, and the only real difference comes at the very end when estimating either the shearing yield strength for static loading or the torsional modulus of rupture and shearing endurance limit for fatigue. So let's now take a look at the ideal values for some of the parameters of your spring design, starting with one that I have mentioned before in previous videos. You should try to have a spring index between 4 and 12. Since this index is the ratio between coil diameter and wire diameter, a small value means that a thick wire, large lowercase d, relative to the diameter of the spring itself, capital D, is gonna be really compressed in the inner section and really stretched and tensed on the outer section because of the bending. Values lower than 4 will increase the chances of the spring being weaker on the outer sections of the spring. The higher limit of this range, the 12, has to do with the higher chance of springs tangling when being packed and shipped. So for values of C over 12, it's usually recommended to pack the springs individually, which introduces an additional cost. The second recommended range is with respect to the number of active coils, and it is between 3 and 15. To maintain linearity when a spring is about to close, and since no spring is perfectly manufactured, meaning that the pitch will not be exactly the same from coil to coil, and we've already studied tolerances, it is necessary to avoid the gradual touching of the coils. If the spring is only 90% compressed towards a solid length, but some of its coils are already touching, their reaction force will lose linearity. The number of active coils effectively affects this touching of the coils, but it is also recommended that the maximum force during service is never higher than 7 eighths of the force required to reach solid length. Calculations are still performed to not overcome the shearing yield strength when a force to reach solid length is applied, but the spring's operating point should be confined to never surpass the 7 eighths of that force. The factor of safety to closure not the maximum recommended force I just mentioned, but the factor of safety you calculate for a force that brings the spring to solid length should be 1.2 or higher. You will learn more about figures of merit during your MEC2 course, but if you're trying to lower costs for the springs you're designing, you would look at the cost of the material you're using and multiply it by the total mass your spring makes up. This would be the specific weight gamma times the volume, which would be a cylinder of diameter lowercase d, your wire diameter, and length pi nt d, which is the number of coils or circles of diameter capital D, your mean spring diameter. For stability, we look at something very closely related to the buckling of a column. If you remember, for columns, you would look at the Euler column formula and solve for the critical load c pi squared ei over l squared, where the second moment of area, i, is the area times the radius of gyration squared and L over K is the slenderness ratio, linked to a mechanics of material video in the description below. 
which is basically how the column was restricted or free to move on each end. The critical load in this expression means that the column would buckle when the load becomes too large. In the case of the springs, we look at the deflection, as for when the deflection becomes too large, the spring can buckle. The effective slenderness ratio in this case is alpha times the free length over d, where alpha takes the place of the end condition value that used c for columns, and l0 is the free length of the spring. c1 prime and c2 prime are dimensionless elastic constants that depend on the elastic and shear modulus e and g. Absolute stability can occur when the term c2 prime over the effective slenderness ratio squared is greater than 1, since we would have a square root of a negative number for our critical deflection expression. If c2 prime is greater than lambda squared, we can solve for the free length to obtain an expression that would restrict its maximum value. And for steels, which is a pretty common material for springs, we can substitute the values for the elastic and the shear modulus e and g. The procedure here is, because of everything we just covered, to either restrict the free length with its stability equation, or to calculate your maximum deflection, free length minus solid length, and make sure that it doesn't exceed the critical deflection. Finally, the wave caused by the vibration within the spring's material that has been subjected to a load causes an effect called spring surge. If one end of a spring is held against a flat surface and the other one is disturbed, a compression wave is created that travels back and forth until it fades away. If the frequency of the applied force resonates with the natural vibratory frequency of the spring, the spring might be subjected to excessive vibrations that can cause additional stress and therefore the spring to fail. I usually include all derivations in these videos, but since this one is related to vibrations more than mechanical design, I'll just add a link to the proof of this derivation in case you want to check it out. The frequency of a spring can be calculated if we know the weight of the active part of a spring and the spring rate or spring constant k. The weight would be the same we used for the figure of merit, only in this case we use the active coils instead of the total number of coils since the wave will not travel through the coils that are in contact with the surface causing the external loads. Okay, let's put all of this together into a quick example. We want to design a compression spring with plain ends using hard drawn wire. The deflection needs to be 9 fourths inches when the external force is 18 pounds and the spring needs to reach solid length when the force is 24 pounds. As per the figure of merit we briefly discussed, we want to select the smallest gauge from a washburn and moan wire. As you can see we have a lot of freedom. However, we have several restrictions, the first one of them being the factor of safety for solid length. Since I don't want that factor of safety to be lower than 1.2, that is gonna be my first restriction. And I know that the factor of safety against yielding is defined as the shearing yield strength over the maximum possible shearing stress, which happens when the spring is fully compressed to its solid length. We also know that the shearing yield strength is a fraction or percentage of the tensile strength. And since pretension was not mentioned, I find that this percentage is 45%. I also know that the tensile strength is a function of the diameter and of course the material. Which for a hard drawn wire, I find that the A coefficient is 140 and the exponent M 0.19. Up to here, I can find the relationship between the wire diameter, lowercase d, and the rest of the variables. However, notice that the wire diameter d depends on c, the spring index, which in turn is a function of lowercase d. And more importantly, this value for c is found inside the curvature correction factor kb. This makes it almost impossible to solve for either lowercase d or c. Fortunately for us, we have another restriction for c. We want the spring index to be between 4 and 12. So that variable is what will vary and will calculate everything else based on its value. But before doing all of those calculations, I know that my spring needs to compress down to 9 fourths of an inch when it's subjected to an 18 pound force. This means that the spring rate or spring constant k is equal to 8 pounds per inch. And I know that the spring rate is a function of the number of coils, which is of course another parameter that I need to define as part of the spring design. By replacing capital D over lowercase d as the spring index c, I can find an expression for the number of active coils. Looking up the shear modulus for this washburn and moan wire, I find that its shear modulus is 11.5 times 10 to the 6 psi. And finally, since I know the free length cannot be a large number 
otherwise the spring would buckle, I need to find an expression that allows me to calculate that free length. If the difference between the free length and the solid length is the maximum deflection, then the free length will be equal to the solid length plus the maximum deflection. And since I already know what the spring constant is and what the force for the solid length is, I know that my free length is gonna be the solid length plus three inches. Of course, I'm not gonna do this calculation over and over on a piece of paper. An easy way to solve any design problem with these many degrees of freedom is to use some software that will allow me to do several iterations in a matter of seconds. I know that the maximum force is 24 pounds, that the starting design factor I'm gonna use is 1.2, that the A coefficient and M exponent for hard drawn wire are 140 and 0 0.19, that the shear modulus is 11.5 times 10 to the 6 psi, and that the end condition constant alpha for a helical compression spring which I can look up online, is 0.5. I know that the recommended values for the spring index are those between 4 and 12. I know that the KB value is dependent on that spring index value. With the expression I found for the wire diameter and all of the properties and parameters I already looked up, I can find a corresponding wire diameter for every C that I'm testing. The coil diameter would be the spring index times the wire diameter, and with the wire diameter, the shear modulus, the spring index, and the spring constant of 8 pounds per inch, I could calculate the number of active coils for each one of the values of C. Up to here, I realized that the value of C has to be greater than 10, otherwise the number of active coils would be higher than 15, which is one of my restrictions. Additionally, because the wire diameter depends on the gauge I select from the washburn and moan wires, I see that the two closest values are 13 gauge wire at 0.0915 inches or 12 gauge at 0.1055 inches. For this reason, even though I'm solving for lowercase d, my selection will be restricted to those values I find for the 12 and the 13 gauge. If for example I'm looking at a diameter of 0.093 from my calculations, I would not be able to select the 13 gauge wire, because for a diameter lower than 0.93, in this case 0.0915, the factor of safety would be lower than 1.2. For this reason, the actual value of D for any of the four results that work so far has to be the 12 gauge wire. Changing the original value from my calculations to what I can actually select from the wire manufacturer makes the first of my four options not viable, since the number of active coils has now come up to 16.37. And the last thing I need to do is check for buckling. For this, I calculate the solid length, which for a plain end spring like this one would be the number of active coils or total coils, in this case it doesn't matter, plus 1 times the diameter of the wire. Because I previously calculated the maximum deflection at 3 inches, the free length would be the solid length plus 3. And going back to the critical length equation that we derived for steels, I can check that my free length is below that critical length value. For every case, the free length is lower than the critical length. So anything with a spring index over 11 and under 12 works for this design. To report my design, for example for a spring index of exactly 11, I would say I'm going to use the 12 gauge wire that my mean coil diameter is 1.16, that the number of active coils is 14.25, which is not a problem since I can have fractions of a turn, and a free length of 4.61 inches. This meets all the requirements and restrictions we looked at today, and if I need to report a factor of safety, I can always do that, which of course is higher than my 1.2 when I decided to select the 12 gauge, which was the closest wire diameter to what my calculations suggested. If you want to check out other spring design scenarios where we use a similar approach to what we used here today, make sure to check out the links in the description below. In the next video, we will analyze the stresses that affect extension springs, where we will see that everything that we've studied so far is applicable and that the new concepts are totally approachable by someone who has all the background knowledge that we've gathered from what we have covered in this course. Thanks for watching.